I first traveled to Afghanistan in 2007 to try and understand what it was like for a young British soldier fighting on the front lines. During this time, I experienced the reality of war and witnessed extraordinary bravery. I want to understand why we've been here for 10 years. I suspect we thought, well, that was the job done. Has the human and financial cost been worth it? I'd give my life to bring him back. And for the first time, I'll come face to face with the Taliban. Whenever I pass through Camp Bastion, I always come to the memorial here to pay my respects. But each time I do, the roll of honor grows longer. When I was last here on Herrick 9, a young Royal Marine called Travis Macking tragically lost his life to an IED while we were on the ground with 4-5 Commando Victor Company. He was the 139th member of the British Armed Forces to lay down his life. I know what that was. Contact ID up here. ID. And so over there. The moment I heard it was an IED strike, my heart sank. In that split second, 22 year old Marine Travis Mackin lost his life. His comrades did everything they could, but his injuries were such that he didn't make it. It's been nearly three years since that tragic day, and I've come to Plymouth to meet up with the Mackin family. Yeah, this is my favorite picture. And I no, that, that's not Kajaki. I don't know where that is, actually. And he's got that beard that he grew, didn't he? Oh, yes. Yeah. It's very. Yeah. It's just this little bits and pieces mounted, really. So he's got his green beret. Yeah. He's got his Feb and Sykes, his commander his medals, dagger. Yeah. And his watch. Belt. Yeah. And obviously, down here, we've got his ashes are in here, um, which. Obviously, we're not ready to scatter anywhere yet, as yet, so really, um, I'll probably keep hold of them for quite some time, I think. And this little candle we light every night. Do you? Him. Yeah. My boys have been my life. They're close, aren't they? Particularly the two eldest, The two you? eldest, yeah. Because <laughs> there was only 17 months between them two, yeah. And it is hard. It's hard because they're not that unit anymore. They're not that same unit. And there's a massive hole in our lives now, big time. And the thing I think about as well is what actually, you know, the time of the explosion, you know, I think about wondering how he was feeling at the time. You know, was he actually aware of what's going on? Was he thinking about family? You know, we will never know. You still haven't said goodbye to him, have you, really? No, and I'll never, ever say goodbye to him. I can't get past the fact that for what he's lost, it's not what I've lost, it's what he's lost. Because 22, and he's lost his life, you know, and he's never bought his own home, he's never married, never had children, never experienced the normal things that people, you know, do in fact, normal family life. And I think sometimes the way I feel is, 
You know, I'd give my life to bring him back. For him to live his... Just have a good time. And do the things he enjoyed. Because he did live life to the full himself. That's how I feel. I'll never, ever say goodbye to him. And I wasn't with him, you know, when he died. And that's hard from a mother's perspective. There's nothing that. But anyway. There's nothing that. Travis has two brothers, Milo and Corbin. Corbin was also in the armed forces, serving with one rifles. Corbin, you were actually in Afghanistan at the time that, that Travis was killed. How did you find out? i just come back from patrol. My uh, sergeant major said to me, the OC wants to speak to you. <laughs> so you knew he said him. that, I knew it. The lads' faces in, in my 10 hours with me looked at me and, and they knew it was bad. I remember it you know, as clear as day, he said to me, he goes, Ralph Mackin, there's no easy way I can say this. Your brother's been killed by an IED in Kajaki. Now what? <laughs> you know, h how could this happen when I found IEDs on my patrols, other lads have found IEDs on their patrols? How can this happen? But yeah, I just remember tears just streaming down my face and I just acting as anyone would that has just lost their brother. Did you go back to Afghanistan? No. I didn't didn't feel I was in the right place because I knew if I went out there, it would have been for only one reason. You'd have gone back and you wanted to take revenge? Yep. Are you angry about what happened to your brother and, and the sacrifices that have been made by other people that went to Afghanistan with you? I'm angry for every life lost. And if we pull out without making any progress, what about them? You know, with injuries they've gained. Well, what about, what, what was that for? And how do you feel, Debbie? Do you think that, you know, if, if British troops eventually leave Afghanistan and the basic way of life for most of the people that live in Afghanistan hasn't been improved by the sacrifices made, how, how will you feel about that? If they pull out and they haven't achieved what they want to achieve, then I just think it was a waste of time. Waste of time since day one and Travis lost his life for nothing. The pain this family continues to endure is a stark reminder of the reality of war. Travis's dad, Bernie, like many grieving parents, has strong opinions on the UK's commitment to Afghanistan. It would appear that we are slowly withdrawing from Afghanistan. The combat troops are now going to be pulled out before 2015. How does that make you feel about the sacrifice that your family has undergone? And in my opinion, um, they should stay there until the job's done. I know that people will disagree with me, but I would like you know, my son to be part of um, a successful mission. Um, and then I can turn around and say, they went in there, it took them over 10 years to sort it out, um, but it's sorted now, um, and, um, and it's better for the Afghan people as well. You think about Trevor every day? Every day, yeah. Um, and um, wherever I go, I've got a little photograph, uh, which I keep in my pocket. Um, he was a, a massive personality in the family. Mm. Um, he's got more friends than the Pope. Uh, honestly, I can't believe how many friends he's got. Um, and um, he's missed dearly by everybody. It's two years, over two years now, since, yeah. since Travis lost his life. Do you? Do you think it's ever going to get better with time? No, no. I, I, you get people that, um, they've been wonderful. People have been wonderful to our family and so supportive and caring. But people do move on, but the family doesn't. The family, the family doesn't move on. Um, I've cried so much. You know, I must have, must have filled a, an Olympic swimming pool with my tears because um, I still, you know, can't believe he's gone. I can't believe he's gone from, uh, from his family. I mean, how did you initially feel when you found out that both Corbin and Travis were both going out on the same herrick? And maybe I, I looked at this the, at the wrong way, but I always had this in the back of my mind and nothing would happen to my boys. To me, they were supermen. 
I used to contact Trev all the time and say, make sure you look after your little brother, you know. Mm. All the time I said, make sure you look after your little brother. And um, he did, but he didn't come back. Today has been a very emotional day. I defy anyone to meet a family like the Mackens and not be affected by it. Uh, two years on after Travis's death, it's as raw for them as it was the first day they were told that he'd been killed. Um, combat troops will leave Afghanistan at the beginning of 2015. Eventually, British troops will withdraw altogether. The politicians will be able to draw a line under Afghanistan and move on to something else. However, for the Mackenzies and other hundreds of families like them, that war will never, ever be ended. And they will be reminded of it until the day they die. At the end of 2014, British combat troops will leave Afghanistan. I've come back to find out if the last 10 years of sacrifice have been worth it. This is Kabul, the capital of Afghanistan. Empires have fought over it for centuries because of its strategic location. Though you'd never know it by this busy market, last month was a bloody one even by Afghan standards. Five suicide bombers attacked the Intercontinental Hotel, killing 15 others. Jan Mohammed Khan, an advisor to President Karzai and the mayor of Kandahar, were both assassinated by suicide bombers. The president's own half-brother, Wali Karzai, was assassinated by his bodyguard. He, bear in mind, was one of the most powerful men in Afghanistan. And just as we arrived here, the coalition suffered its biggest loss to date when a Special Forces helicopter was shot down, killing seven Afghans and 31 Americans, some of whom were members of the Navy SEAL Team 6, the elite unit that killed Osama bin Laden. The Taliban lost control here in 2001. However, their influence on the city continues. Suicide bombings and murderous raids on high-profile targets are telling the world that the Taliban are far from finished. I'm meeting Sir William Patey, the British ambassador to Afghanistan. If we came here in 2001 to get rid of Al-Qaeda and Osama bin Laden, how did we end up staying for 10 years? I think what we did in 2001 is we came in, we overthrew the Taliban, who had provided a safe haven for Al-Qaeda. And I suspect we thought, well, that was the job done. Um, uh, and I'm conscious that when uh, it was in 2003 that we invaded Iraq, um, and I think we took our eye off the ball. And I think what happened was, while we were in Iraq, uh, the uh, Taliban thought, hello, there's an opportunity here, and began to regroup and regenerate. In 2008, 2009, there was the realization that we took our eye off the ball, and we began to invest the resources needed to, uh, to build up an Afghanistan that would be in a safe enough state for us to leave. Presently, we're cutting back on our military across the board. Um, people are looking to problems back in the UK, particularly lately. Um, are we going to be able to justify spending money on the Afghan National Army and the Afghan National Police and its security when people at home, rightly so, have concerns about where we sit? Well, it's going to be a What's best for us? Yeah, as a no, nation? it's a reasonable question. Uh, I think the reality is that we're going to be spending a lot less. I mean, we are currently spending over five billion uh, pounds a year on uh, on uh, on our commitment to a Afghanistan. A lot of people will be shocked at home. Yeah, five yeah. billion pounds. Five billion pounds to, on, on our commitment here. The Afghan, the Americans are spending over a hundred billion. Uh, but what we're talking about is when our forces when our forces withdraw uh, out of combat and the Afghans are doing the work, um, our costs are going to go down dramatically. Will we be leaving Afghanistan in a better place when we eventually pull out of Afghanistan? I think we'll be certainly leaving Afghanistan in a better place. Uh, I think we'll be leaving it on a path to a place that has never been. 
uh, free of war and free of, uh, free of conflict. Uh, that won't happen by 2015, but it could happen by 2025. You know, that's the most optimistic scenario and there's a long way to go and a lot of things could go wrong. But I'm absolutely convinced that we've done everything we could to give Afghanistan a chance. Uh, and I think all the young men and women who've given their lives for this country, their sacrifice will not have been in vain. One of the hardest things I have to do is to write to the next of kin of the young men and women who die in this country. And it's very important that I try and explain what it is they've died for and how important it is and that their sacrifice won't be in vain and that they are genuinely contributing to security and stability in this country. And I say to my staff every day, we mustn't let them down. We must work as hard as we can to give this country the best chance it has to emerge free of the conflict it's seen over the last 30 years. A large number of lives have been lost on both sides of this war, but it's fair to say the Afghan people by far have lost the most. I want to understand what drives the Taliban on when they are faced with such overwhelming odds. Located on the outskirts of Kabul is the dreaded Polisharki prison. This houses some of Afghanistan's most dangerous inmates, including members of Al-Qaeda. It's also where I'm going to meet the Taliban for the first time. Polisharki is infamous for overcrowding, murder and rape. It's alleged that during the communist era, 27,000 political prisoners were tortured and murdered here. More recently, the Taliban have organized terror cells from behind its bars. The new governor, General Bazoudi, was appointed to bring order to this prison that is heavily overcrowded with 6,000 inmates. This is just a small example of the drugs that come into uh, Polisharki. They're being brought in for use by the inmates, is that correct? Did the Taliban take drugs? And does that happen? Do they recruit inside this prison? Do they get people to come on side? So basically this is uh, electrical cabling that's been split open, so it's got very sharp edges to it. I can't imagine what it must be like to have the full force of a man hitting you with that. Corruption and intimidation is still a major problem. In April 2011, around 500 prisoners escaped from a Kandahar prison, many of them Taliban. Security forces have said they could only have escaped with help from the inside. So which bit of the prison is this? And what kind of prisoners are in, in the block one? But as far as we have been able to see, we have been able to see that the block one is not a good thing. We have been able to see that the block one is not a good thing. We have been able to see that the block one is not a good thing. How many in a cell? The block one is not a good thing. And how big are the cells? And how big are the cells? Four meters by three meters, and you get eight men in there, very confined. They belong six hundred and twenty people. We have to belong to two hundred and fifty people. The authorities had granted us permission 
to film in the cells, but at short notice, the governor refuses his entry. In an unstable country where the rules change daily, this comes as little surprise. Uh, nobody's allowed to film inside the blocks and uh, uh, nobody's uh, allowed to film inside the right. After lengthy negotiations, we come to a compromise. The governor allows us to speak to the Taliban prisoner in a secure compound. You remember the Taliban, is that correct? So how did you end up here? As a Taliban, do you think that Mullah Omar will control this country at one point, one day? Don't you think a lot of people, particularly in places like Kabul, are too westernized now that they'll never accept uh, extreme Sharia law and go back to things like swift justice? Where is their strength, do you think, because they're not going anywhere or because they think, do you think they have the backing of the majority of the people? Haven't the Afghan people suffered enough? What about the suicide bombers and the IEDs? After four and a half years of coming out here and seeing young men die on the battlefield and lots of Afghan nationals die, it was quite odd for me to come face to face with, with the Taliban and the people who are responsible for, for killing lots of young men that I've met. They have time on their side, they're not going anywhere. They're, they're dedicated. I think they have a point that, you know, members of the Afghan National Army are there because they're paid rather than because they're fighting for a cause. After spending such a short time with the Taliban, it's difficult to come to any definite conclusions. However, their beliefs, commitment and their faith are such that I believe they will never give up the fight. Afghanistan has changed dramatically since the Taliban lost power here in 2001. The days when women would be punished or even abused for walking on their own are long gone. However, the lurking fear that the Taliban could return is ever present. Habib, a local journalist, gives me an insight into the feelings of the people of Kabul. I'm especially worried about my three sisters. Um, I have three young sisters. I, I was planning to, to go abroad and study, but uh, I changed my plan, uh, plans as soon as I heard the 2014 deadline, because I, I rem remember what happened to, to women during the uh, first civil war era in, in the 90s. Um, I can tell you a story. I was I was very young at the time, and I was playing with a bunch of kids uh, in in my neighbor's house, and suddenly a, a group of uh, militias uh, broke into um, our, our neighbor's house, and they um, handcuffed him and put him in a room, and then they brought his uh, young daughter and his wife, and they gun raped her, uh, gun raped them, and they forced him to watch it, and the next morning before. Uh, before dawn, he left the, the neighborhood without taking anything with him. He took his family, only his family with him, and we never heard the, from him back. And later, uh, somebody told us that his daughter committed suicide. But who knows, maybe his father has, has killed her, because that happens a lot. After a, daughter, a, a, a girl is raped, 
she is either killed by her brother or by her father. But aren't people, they've had so long now without the Taliban, without total Sharia law, you know, people have all got cars, mobile phones, uh, computers, access to the internet, music. I mean, that would be outlawed if the Taliban controlled this country again. Do you really think that young people will allow that to happen? Well, I don't think that most of the, the, uh, the new generation of Afghans will stay in the country. They will definitely flee to, to the, either to the neighboring countries or they will uh, illegally uh, uh, go to, to Europe and the United States. So the country will be empty again, uh, like uh, the 90s, late 90s uh, under the Taliban. If the Americans leave here, if ISAF leave uh, this country, um, to the Taliban. How will you feel? Will you feel that they've let you down? That they didn't fulfill the promises that they made? Totally. They will, uh, they will leave us to the mercy of uh, a bunch of uh, brutal, cruel fundamentalists uh, that we know what they're capable of. If Afghanistan become unstable and uh, insecure again, uh, it will definitely become a safe haven uh, for the terrorists again. And again, our, our, soil, our soil and country will be used as a base against uh, other countries. Despite his concerns, Habib has connections with the Taliban. He's arranged for me to meet with the main spokesman of its political wing. This carries obvious risks and has taken time to negotiate. His name is Akbar Agar. He's an ex-Mujahideen fighter, a prominent Taliban commander. He served time in Polishaki prison for kidnapping three members of the UN. What now are the objectives of the Taliban in terms of this country? What do they want? What do they see the future of this country being? Taliban is a real hope the Taliban is a real hope Afghanistan is a Afghanistan is a real hope. Taliban is a Afghanistan is a real hope. Taliban is a Afghanistan is a real there's been war in this country for a very long time. I think most of the people here are very tired because of all the fighting and very sad because of all the fighting. Do you think that there will be eventual peace in this country and a negotiated peace? <laughs> Taliban Ragilidi, Kanurtok Ragilidi, Aradimilat Pamlatar Bandi Ragilidi, Mlatim Ramlatar Kalidi. Many people that I've spoken to, Afghans, say that if the Americans leave, and the Taliban will take over. I'm pretty shaken as the Taliban of Pakadala, the Marki Papanistan, the Wakalat Okmat Kalidi, the Okmata Sehalak Dirazidi. I'm not the Lodi Pamelki, I'm not the Satalu the Milk, Olao, Zina, Narawa, Haram, that Shani Tora, the Manda Uluwa, no Halak Shahatiri, the Taliban of Salari, Kedali Sida Karbus. And will it go back to being the same regime, even though people have got used to now, you know? the schooling of, 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 of women and the changing of certain areas of dress. Um, women are now in the, in the army and the police. Will those things happen under the Taliban regime or will it go back to the way it was? Auralu the Shudu Hukukuta, Murdo Shudu Hukuk, Taliban, Hum the Shudu the Hukuk Mkhalip Nidi, for the Shirat Pachokatki, Tura Panan Chidi, I had the Shirat Pachokatki, Pakistan, the Shudu Hukuk Wali. Our Dessie Hukuk, that Chapel is Tilad, Dessie Hukuk Murdo Shudu Nawaru, Zmachpel and other Destia, only Taliban Wali, no Nora Panan Wali Chiara, the Harjan or a Kamilak Harishkir. Why do you think all these foreigners are in your country then? Why, why is ISAF here? Why are the United States in your country? Chi Duni Mozona of Afghanistan, Chiara, American Ralalta. او هون تلفات چې په امریکا کې رسولي او د ونې په سوا او ترپات په افغانستان کې ورسیدي او نور به هم راضي ملک در بدر سو ټک ټک سو 
نو زه فکر کوم چې زما په فکر باندې دا به دا د دوی راتګ دا زه خپل نه قانوني بولم او نه د افغانستان د پاره پایده بولم بلکې دا د افغانستان په ضرر بولم طالبان د افغانستان خلک دي او خارجان نه دي او طالبانو کې اکثر هغه خلک دي چې د افغانستان په جبهو کې مجاهدین وو افغانستان نیولی دی د زندرانو د خلکو د تکلیفو د ظلمو سی خلک خلاص کړي دي د افغانستان خلک او نه پردي خلک دي نه بل څوک دي د افغانستان خلک دي په مدارسو کې تعلیمونه کړي دي په مدرسو کې تعلیم کړي دي او اسلامي تعلیم یې کړي دي او خو داس خلک دي اکبر اګاز ویژن اف ا فیوچر افغانستان سیمز ټو می to be in direct conflict with the views held by most modern Afghans. While they all long for a corrupt, free, stable and peaceful country, it's doubtful that the majority would suffer the strict regime the Taliban has to offer. ISAF combat troops will leave Afghanistan by the end of 2014. You have to wonder what's going to happen to the multi-billion dollar infrastructure that has been built here. Camp Bastion, which has grown out of the desert, is now the size of Reading and still growing. After a two and a half month gap, I'm on my way back to meet the men of Whiskey Company 4-5 Commando. When I was with them last, it adopted a population-centric approach to defeating the Taliban by gathering local information and using high-tech surveillance equipment. They were able to pinpoint, locate, and remove high-ranking members of the Taliban. I want to find out how successful this new tactic has been and whether counterinsurgency can ever be truly effective unless it has the total backing of the local population. Whiskey Company are coming to the end of their six-month tour in Nad Ali South. Thankfully, no one has been killed or injured during their time here. It's great to be back amongst friendly faces, but it's very clear everyone's looking forward to going home. Right. It's nice and cool in these at night, though. Yeah. Yeah, we are super right. So, get your kit off, get sorted, and then, um, yeah. as in, get your kit off the wagons rather than get your kit yeah, off. <laughs> the village of Zargan Calais is testament to the success of Whiskey's time here. It's now a relatively secure area, and its school is at long last being rebuilt. This is a school, or what's left of it, at Zargan Calais. It's been destroyed twice, blown up by the Taliban twice. Um, the, the meeting that um, occurred today, the Shura, has hopefully secured the fact that this will now be built with government money and it will be demolished, what's left of it, with ISAF money. But for me, anyone that's involved in this project is a very brave person because even if you're helping to demolish it, whether you're going to come and teach in it or even if you're going to attend it as a student, you will run the risk of losing your life at the hands of the Taliban. head teacher another teacher here yeah these are very brave men to come back and teach at this school in view that the Taliban may come back and stop the school from operating again uh, yes yeah, so Zargon Calais a village have a uh, security uh, they are very happy to teach uh, they are coming to high school um, are you not worried as a teacher here now that that might happen again to you? No, I was fine. I was fine. I saw Kwai saw how pretty the Alta Huit Shayamno, Alta Napolis, and I saw on the Bolso. So cars were clear at the Tlaura at Lashway. What does he think about the Tal Taliban wanting to destroy education for young people? The day the Parachi Taliban Papanistanke, a warrior to do the Ajanabiano Mazurandi, 
او د خپل بادارانو لپاره یې کار کړی وي هغه غواړي چې دغه ملک بنیاد خراب کړي معرف د ملک بنیاد دی نو د دې لپاره چې د ملک بنیاد خراب شي بیا ټول ملک ورانېږي که د ملک بنیاد خراب نه وي بیا ملک نه ورانېږي د هغوی مطلب دا دی چې هغه بنیاد د ملک باید خراب شي If Afghanistan is to have any chance of a secure future, then investing in the education of its young people must be a priority. The efforts of Whiskey Company, led by Major Paul Maynard, to stabilize, secure, and help rebuild local communities has been largely successful. However, just four kilometers away, the war rages on. We're walking around here now. I mean, this is an counterinsurgency success story, isn't it? This particular area is, yeah. It's not a done deal yet. It's not irreversible. Uh, but certainly all the signs are positive. Um, and is, this is the result of many years' worth of sacrifice and effort. this sort of thing until you've established security and really we didn't establish security in this area our predecessors did what we've done is ensure that the uh, campaign momentum of building on that security um, and bringing development and bringing hope to the local population focusing on them rather than focusing on the increasingly weakening enemy you just discussed the fact that this is quite frustrating as raw marine commandos this is not really your role but you've adapted to it and you've taken on the mantle that you know you've carried on the baton that was left for you and you're going to hand that back on now to the scots but we know just up the road four clicks up the road you know four two are having a pretty hard time with it we all know some of the guys that have been lost on this tour or seriously injured and uh, you know and of course our thoughts are, uh, are with their colleagues if we are genuinely going to achieve something tangible then we need to do the right thing and the right thing at the moment is to focus on maintaining the security bubble that's been achieved and fill that security bubble with development and community to pride um, that will show them that life under this government, as enabled by ISAF and the NSF, is, is better than the alternative. I was expecting you know, to get my hands dirty and get a few rounds down, but it hasn't been like that. It's been completely different. Has that frustrated you? Um, in a way, we're only a kilometre away or so from uh, Juliet Company, from 4 Suit Commando, uh, just to the north. You know, they're in contacts like week in, week out, and we, we can you see You can hear it. We can, can hear, hear it. it. We you can see earlier, the attack yeah. helicopters flying yeah, you, in. Yeah, you see Apaches flying in, giving it the hellfire yeah. every now and then. And uh, it is kind of frustrating because we're sat not too far away and it's all happening. And, uh, you know, in a way, yeah, we do want a piece of the action, but we know at the same time, Juliet Company had a really hard time, had a tough tour, lost, yeah. lost a couple of lads. Yeah. So, um, you know, it's a double edged sword, really. Now, if you ask any of those guys when they left uh, Condor, their base up in Scotland, that they'd be throwing stones with Afghan children to clear a football pitch, they'd have probably laughed at you. Most of them were expecting young children to be throwing something very different at them. This is what the whole idea of counterinsurgency is about. Those young boys, the relationship you're building with those soldiers behind me, I hope will make them less inclined to listen to some extremist who'll want them to strap a bomb to themselves or go and lay an IED or pick up a rifle. The devastating war in Afghanistan has been ongoing for the last decade. I first came here in 2007. I wanted to find out what it was like for a young British soldier fighting on the front line in a 21st century war. We're now fixing bayonets. We're actually going to get involved now. It's hard to explain the first time I came under enemy fire. That's, what's that? That's fucking hell. But each and every time it happened, one thing's for sure, it's terrifying. Get down, get down. Ross, stay on the track! The heart-stopping moments. Enemy! Running for your life. The bravery of the troops. These moments never leave you. It's the most exciting morning I've had in a very fucking long time, I can assure you of that. The lighter moments of war are heightened as 
are the darker times. I'll never, ever say goodbye to him. I said I don't want to meddle, I just want you, Chris. To make sure you come home. It's not. One thing is very clear. This war has cost countless lives and cost billions of dollars. The legacy of this conflict will stay in the minds of many for decades to come. reasons have been given why after 10 years of British soldiers are still fighting here in Afghanistan. They range from defeating Al-Qaeda to preventing the Taliban from taking power to the stabilization and reconstruction of a country in ruins after years of conflict. Some believe that it also makes political sense to have a military footprint in a country that borders Iran and Pakistan. The simple fact is though that the cost in lives and money does not equate to the success on the ground here. Afghanistan is still the fourth poorest country in the world and its largest opium producer. Corruption is endemic. There is an over-reliance on foreign aid and tribal and ethnic differences only serve to perpetuate the problems here. At the end of 2014, British troops will cease combat operations, though some will remain on the ground in an advisory role. Undoubtedly, the Afghan National Army will continue to rely on air and ground support from NATO forces for the foreseeable future. The Taliban have stated that they will not give up their jihad until the last foreign soldier leaves this country. I believe that if there is ever to be some kind of peace or stability in this country, that it will only be brought about through a political solution, and that will require the involvement not only of Afghanistan's neighbors, but its tribal elders, the Taliban themselves, and most importantly, the will of its people. In the years that I've been coming out here, one thing has remained continuous, and that has been the professionalism, the courage, and the tenacity of the British soldier. I only hope that in years to come, the sacrifices made by them and their families will not be forgotten.